مساء الخير Good evening uh, Thank you very much for being here uh, I'd like to uh, thank everybody actually uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak about uh, the music of my country and uh, actually here the purpose is to give a flavor of what kind of diversified uh, music uh, tastes we have in the country and give a flavor of the history. So uh, before I go ahead and explain the kinds of uh, music that we have, uh, I'll give a picture of how these subcultures of music are uh, laid out on the map and then uh, I'll talk about the sources, or the sources of the earliest traces of the Saudi music. Actually, we have uh, very good sources for that, and uh, we'll just hear some of them. And then we'll go into some kind of music appreciation. We will try to touch on the forms, instruments, musicians, and the culture. And then we'll conclude with the prospect. So uh, one of the comments that I carry from the book of Lisa uh, Okervich, uh, the professor of the uh, American uh, University in Kuwait, uh, she did a good research about the music in the Arab Peninsula. And she started the book by saying that John Philby stated that Saudi Arabia is the land of no music or musicless land. And she said that Philby actually was wrong because of maybe several reasons. Uh, one of these reasons is that maybe he had no access or maybe the places or the experiences he had didn't lead him to see or uncover the kind of music that we have in the place. So uh, there are many ways actually to look at the subcultures of our music, but I will go with Lisa's uh, classification, which is logical. Uh, there are many other uh, more complex ways of classif classifying the regions of our music. So basically, there are two main regions, which is Najd and the Gulf. And I'll show them on the map shortly. And then there is Hijaz and the Southwest. Uh, but uh, we can also classify the music into uh, subcategories. For example, uh, we have the folk versus the urban. We have the Bedouin or Hadar or the sea music, or the land, uh, land music versus the sea music. We have also those kinds of musics that we play during occasions or uh, during a warfare or seasonally. And actually, we have many, many forms and many flavors. And uh, we have many musics. Actually, this Saudi music could be classified into uh, the family of the maqam music, which is a widespread over the Middle East, going to Turkey, to uh, Greece, uh, going to the east, to the east uh, towards China, and uh, to Morocco. However, there are other flavors that are being coming to the place, similar to any place in the world where it can uh, communicate back and forth with other cultures because of many reasons. Uh, uh, also, these kinds of uh, pieces or uh, musics that we have are not only individual pieces. Some of them are very much systemized in a way of wasla or fasl or anoba or a suite. So, looking in the map, you see Najd in the middle. That's grouped together with the east side of Saudi Arabia by the Gulf. So that's Najd and the Gulf. And the other group of music uh, uh, flavor is going to Hijaz, which is by the Red Sea going down to the southwest. Go ahead. So uh, do we have any trace of an early uh, Saudi music? Do we have recordings? Uh, we know that one of the uh, very big challenges we have as musicians or hysterians of music or producers of music 
is the challenge of having the music change by time. And there are many reasons for that. You know, people travel, they get music to listen to, they learn uh, instruments from other cultures. Uh, there is the media uh, influence. Many reasons could lead to the change of the face of the music of any place, actually. And there are maybe two kinds of music. Music that's for now, to consume now. And those kinds of musics that are there to stay. So looking at our music in, in Saudi Arabia, actually, uh, we were looking for the recordings because there is nothing that could mimic the kind of music we used to have at a certain time or age better than recordings because things uh, just go by time and then you should have only recordings or maybe videotapes if, if, if could uh, mimic the uh, live performance of a music that carries the characteristics and the facets, the traits of the music we are looking into. Uh, the earliest possible was for sure the gramophone. We were lucky to have some recordings of the gramophone recordings, actually the uh, wax cylinders. And I'll shortly tell you where these are coming from and when. Uh, for the writings, we don't really have something of major. It's only an effort of uh, modern writers and modern authors that are trying to classify or describe our music. Some of these works are very much respected, but we need to do a lot actually on this part. And you know the other sources will be the oral transitions, which is changing by time. And uh, this will link with the, the culture and the traditions that link to the music. And, uh, you know, uh, we can summarize it into the uh, transformational memes where these are uh, moving uh, vertically and horizontally. However, these are not going to guarantee any phase of music that we are talking about. So uh, let's see some of the examples of the traces we have so far that reflects the music of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Snoke uh, uh, came to Saudi Arabia in a visit. He used to be a Dutch missionist uh, in Indonesia. And he came to uh, Hijaz, actually, in the 1884 to 1885. He spent around a year in there. And uh, actually, uh, he came for a study of the culture. And uh, part of his interest was the music in there. However, at that time, there was no recording uh, devices when he uh, was uh, in Hijaz at the time. Uh, however, he had a very good understanding. He, he spoke Arabic. Some say he converted to Islam. And uh, actually, he lived and had access to the musicians, which is our concern here. And uh, when he went back home, uh, just before the Hajj season, uh, he sent uh, such instruments, which is the wax cylinder uh, recorder at that time, was the early time of uh, recording music in the world, which came with Edison. Uh, at that time, he sent these uh, uh, recording machines to Hijaz, actually, to some of his uh, 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 colleagues in there who he worked with. Some of them are from uh, Indonesia, uh, staying uh, in the consulate. Uh, of uh, Holland at that time and he gave them instructions of what to record and how to describe and uh, they were sending these letters we have also some copies of the letters going back and forth uh, describing the forms the instruments uh, the classification of music and so on so actually the recordings went from 1906 to 1909 which is a very early time of recordings uh, in the world, actually, rather than uh, in our area. So we were lucky, actually, to have these. Uh, in the picture on the, uh, for the portrait, this guy is, uh, is Snook. And the, on, the, on the other side, this is a, a picture of a live recording that happened in February 1909 on the phonograph. 
and you see the instrument uh, being held by uh, Qambus, and these guys might be doing some dana or one of these forms in Hijaz. Also, some other traces uh, we heard uh, from some of the researchers that somebody named Jasim al Mashmoum, he is from the eastern province. He recorded in Iraq in the 20s. That's a very early time compared to the later recordings. However, uh, we couldn't get a copy of what it was recorded for uh, Jasim. And uh, without these recordings, actually, uh, it's really very, very difficult to know the characteristic and the, uh, uh, the look and feel of what kind of music we used to have at that time. However, we could also cheat by looking into the neighbors because some of our neighbors were lucky to have recordings later after 1906 and 1909, like for example in Kuwait and Bahrain. There are recordings of the 1929, 1927, which happened in, uh, in Iraq and in Bahrain, uh, sorry, in Iraq, and uh, some of them went to Egypt. But we do have other recordings too uh, in Egypt for uh, people from the country. So another source will be looking in the recordings and writings and uh, borrowings that people take. For example, we hear in an interview of Saleh al-Kuwaiti who is uh, an Iraqi composer and a violinist that he used to be playing Hijazi music in his childhood, in his, uh, childhood or early time of his learning. And uh, we see, for example, on those early recordings, some of the Najdi or uh, Hijaini or some other forms that are coming from our country actually being existing today of that time, of the 20s, uh, late 20s. Sorry. Now the question is, uh, why are we concerned about these uh, sources and recordings? Uh, you know that uh, music is an identity of uh, the countries. And the music cannot be just uh, come out from anywhere by having uh, an uh, exercise of creativity. It is very much rooted to the language. It's very much rooted to the syllables of the language. Uh, it is coming from the emotions and the lifestyle of people. Sometimes it's linked to the work activities. Sometimes it's uh, related to the time where these guys have some uh, joyful time. We call it uns. Uh, or maybe at the time of a war. So these are reflected into their musics. This is happening everywhere in the world. We are looking for these sources to try to see the purest possible flavor of music we have. In, in our country, the earliest possible. Because after then came the movies, the radio stations, the TVs, and the commercialized music that went everywhere and people get influenced by these musics that has changed their own music. And we need to see where is a, a pivot source actually for where we go further uh, in our music. Uh, the difficulty for having these sources available in our country is attributed to accessibility where many people were not invited to come and do a study, a research, recording of day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day music that's happening on occasions or happening at any time uh, in life. So uh, b being having the, the permit to, uh, to access a group or an exercise of music was a difficulty due to the nature of the setup uh, here in the old days. Uh, also, the culture and traditions is another barrier because if this group is exercising or living a certain kind of music, then that, that music is, 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 the, is for that culture or that subculture. So somebody to come and watch that subculture may make these guys uncomfortable or maybe not exercise the exact music that they do between themselves. And this is actually normal because if you are in a gathering of a music concert, which is a natural music concert, versus another one which is being recorded, 
or being attended by uh, other people, it will not be the same. It can't be the same unless these guys are professional and trained for so. And there are the uh, barrier of the religious interpretation of what's the music and is it respected? Can it be uh, a source of living? Can it be something to be proud of? So that was uh, another barrier. And then I just mentioned the radio and TV. And we have tried our best in the previous uh, festivals that we did in Janadriya to reflect some of these traditions and genres of music across the country. So going back to Snook, uh, if you see the box in here, this is a, a top view of a box. Actually, there were 300 wax cylinders. They are still existing in Leiden Institute. Uh, mostly from the exercise of 1906 to 1909. They were said to be released in 1984 where they were discovered. Uh, up to 1994, uh, some people said uh, this was not actually being in public even though these are out of the copyrights because of the time they were uh, recorded. Uh, these cylinders covered a lot of uh, recordings actually going from stories being told by people at that time, to street life sounds, to prayer calls, to Holy Quran recordings, and some music recordings, which were uh, actually being directed by 50% going to the Hijazi music and 50% going to the Yemeni music at that time. And this statement clarifies that the Hijazi music is a standalone, very well-known music compared to the Yemeni music because some people will mix the two actually. I'm not here saying that they don't get influences from each other. I'm saying that they are standalone by themselves. Uh, the other pictures on the other side are by Mutrub al Hijaz al Sharif Hashim. This is a Majas, uh, and this was recorded uh, in the 1920 in Egypt by Mission Company, which is the company that recorded for Sayyid Darwish, the very well known composer. And the other one here is also for him. Uh, how about listening to some of these soon? This is which slide? Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, later on, uh, for the Hijazi people, uh, uh, the, the guy with the oud, the instrument, uh, actually, uh, he went to Egypt and uh, we will listen to some of his recordings. Some of them are pure Hijazi and some are influenced by the Egyptian takht or ensemble that recorded with him because they are not trained on the Hijazi music, right? And the other one is Saeed Abu Khashaba, who is said to be a very famous oud uh, uh, player. So that sometimes he will play oud and will not sing, but we will listen to his voice too. Uh, actually, uh, these guys uh, recorded a lot of recordings. We have received many for Hashim Al-Abdali. Uh, and uh, some people from Najd also went to Bahrain, but this is too late, like after the 50s, which the movies are in, the radios, the TVs, whatever. So you cannot guarantee the, what I say, the purity of the music at the time, the earliest time possible. And there are some interruptions that caused uh, these recordings not to happen, which is, for example, the World War II. Uh, then came the radio and television uh, with Tariq Abdul Hakim and some radio in Jeddah that started in uh, 1948. And uh, after that, we were able to record some of the genres of these musics, which go in the span and the spectrum of folk, urban, traditional, all sorts of music, but we didn't cover the whole spectrum yet. Yes, let's listen to some music. I'll try to comment a bit on, on these. We'll start with the Holy Quran.
All right, so this is the Holy Quran recitation by some sheikh. We don't know his name. It was stated that this was recorded in 1885, but I doubt it because the mission uh, of Snook was in that time, but the recording happened after he left. And because of the availability of the machines there, it was very scarce that we have uh, a recording uh, at that time. It was not commercialized yet, the, the machines. The earliest uh, record that we know of goes back to the 1992, uh, uh, of uh, some of the theater uh, pioneers which happened in the United States uh, by uh, some of the musicians with Abu, uh, Ahmed Abu Khalil Qabbani, which is later than the stated uh, date in here. Also another recording of an Egyptian pioneer which is Abdul Hamouli was in uh, 1895 because he went to Istanbul and recorded. So I doubt that the 1885 was a possible recording of this uh, Holy Quran recitation. Can I see the folder, please? If you can show the folder, show the folder on the screen. Yes. So please go ahead. Yes, this is uh, Hashem al-Abdali. And you see the Egyptian style of playing music because this was recorded in Egypt by an ensemble, Egyptian ensemble. see a flavor of the Hijazi sound here in the middle of the Egyptian performance. <laughs> Next file. This is uh, 1909. This is 1909 recordings. And you know, this sound is the needle on that old recording. Okay, next one. This is a recording in the 30s in Singapore. This is Saeed Abu Khashaba. Next is uh, the guy who was very famous for the wood playing. Go ahead.
This is in the 20s, possibly. <laughs> So you could you could see the flavor of the expression, the emotions, when the oud comes for uh, I mean the instrument time, uh, the reaction of the audience. Let's listen to the next one, a bit of it. <laughs> Much cleaner recording for a later recording. <laughs> Okay, next is one of the very early recordings in Singapore. I think uh, enough of the earliest recordings. Now we know that there are uh, lots of recordings not being uh, uncovered yet. Uh, some of them are those related to Leiden Institute, some are somewhere else. Uh, we'll go to the next folder uh, in the recordings. Uh, now we, we, we discussed uh, the two main areas of uh, 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 musics that are grouped into Hijaz, and the southwest versus Najd and the upper Gulf. So let's listen to some of these forms. Uh, it's, it was really difficult for me to find an early recording of these, as I told you, because of those factors that contributed to having the scarcity of these recordings. I could go and pick a recording of yesterday or 10 years back, but these are not similar to the originality and the uh, authenticity of what we have just heard now. So these are some good recordings here. Uh, this is a dosari Khwezani uh, rhythmic uh, form. Okay, uh, let me just comment on, uh, on these kinds of musics. Actually, uh, every place in the world has a characteristic of, uh, of his music. Some of them will, will focus more on rhythmic uh, compositions. Some of them will focus on uh, like the scales being uh, so wide, so variant. Some will just focus on uh, a bit of uh, number of notes in a scale and try to produce a long story of it. And uh, uh, maybe later on I'll come back to this point uh, towards the end of the slide when I talk about Bela Bartok and Zoltan Kodai for a similar need of uh, looking into such things. So uh, actually, you will see here that these rhythms uh, are polyrhythms. They are rhythms that are going in parallel where two different kinds of genres of rhythms are going uh, together in three or four lines uh, very well matured, they are very lengthy, and sometimes you know that there is a silence on the 17th spot, okay? Or sometimes uh, the, the first hit should not be uh, produced after five times or whatever. And these guys are very well trained, actually. They are very well trained. Uh, let's hear the Majroor uh, kind of form. 
This is an urban kind of majroor because the other one is a folk kind. So the rhythm here is less intricate than the first one. And you know Talal Maddah for sure. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, the first one is a kind of, of dosery uh, music. The second one is majroor, which is originated mostly from Taif. It's very much attributed to Taif, and whenever you ask about Taif area music, they say majroor. We have majroor, even though they have many other kinds of uh, music genres. Going to Asir, we have the khatwa. This is a female uh, singing. <laughs> Actually here, this is like a question-answer kind of form with the rhythm, and uh, at the same time, uh, the kind of sweet they do in such music is sometimes not very clear when you hear just a piece of it. Sometimes the sweet is made up of many uh, subcomponents that they are coming in sequence. Some of them are rhythmic, some are free uh, of rhythms. Some of them going into the upper uh, voice or lower voice. Uh, next ones are kind of folk music. This is from Rijal Al Ma. Uh, it's it's a kind of warfare music. <laughs> Okay, uh, you notice that I didn't bring any, any kind of commercial or modern music in here. And this is the purpose actually of showing uh, the many kinds of types of uh, musics we have. These are mostly folk or urban, but not the commercialized version of it. Next one, this is the Razfa from Najran. So you notice the, the many types and uh, kinds of rhythms, uh, the way they, they execute their music actually. Uh, we have variants and diversified kinds of, of music that are very good source of ideas for today's production of music. Uh, let's go next. So uh, let's go for Najd and the Gulf region. Uh, I chose the Khammari as an example. Uh, this gentleman here is Bin Laboon, a very famous uh, poet who was born in Najd in the 1790, and he passed away in the 1831 uh, in uh, Kuwait. Uh, actually, this guy was very well known for a very high standard of poetry that he was innovating for the subjects, for playing with the linguistic skills. And he was very w well known in the whole peninsula, uh, provided that he traveled uh, in many places. And he has contributed actually to the form of Khammari. And Khammari is, state of, uh, is said to be one of the state high sophisticated kind of rhythmic, high uh, sophisticated kind of uh, lyrics used in uh, producing such kind of uh, music. Khammari actually has many types, many types. Some of them are attributed to his name. So they say Khammari Labuni to uh, Bin Labun. Uh, let's hear some example maybe later. I'll just mention him again. Uh, let me just continue the slide. Uh, 
for a second. The other kind, which is in the picture here, is the kind of fjiri, and the fjiri is uh, a kind of a sweet, it's a very complicated kind of music that was uh, actually uh, came up with uh, in Bahrain, okay, uh, with a story about uh, uh, genies and some musicians went to a faraway uh, district and tried to make music. They heard some weird music and they learned this from the genies. So regardless of the story, this is a very sophisticated kind of music, even uh, uh, Olson in his book about the music in Bahrain, uh, the Danish uh, researcher who recorded a lot of pieces in there, he, he uh, stated that this, the rhythm here is so complicated that we have too many sorts of it. And we will hear some examples, actually. And the suite starts with a jrihan, uh, suite, uh, sorry, uh, piece. Then it goes to tanzila. Then it goes into uh, complex rhythms. And there are a lot of types of uh, fijiri similar to khammari. And the fijiri actually is being practiced during the time where the pearl fishermen, they don't go for uh, you know, for the pearls for the six months, it's the other six months of the year where they stay home and they have the once time where they enjoy their time. They stay from uh, after the sunset to the fajr time, which is the downtime. That's why maybe the name Fijiri or maybe some other sort of meaning for other researchers. Uh, this is a very well known kind of uh, suite that we have in the uh, Gulf area of Saudi Arabia, actually. And uh, especially in Darin, we heard that they are really uh, one of the best people doing fjiri other than those uh, in the Gulf. And we will hear some examples later. And one of the very sophisticated classical kind of music that we have in the east uh, of Saudi Arabia is the salt. And maybe it's good to elaborate on this. This is, if you go for the, the types of music we have, you know, this is a kind of music that we do uh, on the land where the workers are not busy with, you know, going on the sea for any kinds of work. There are a lot of other arts that they use during work or maybe uh, during certain kind of work or on some occasions. The salt is uh, actually is a, is a very uh, sophisticated invention that's attributed to Abdullah al-Faraj in Kuwait who uh, uh, died in 1901. And the salt types are Shami, Arabi, uh, Khayali, and then there are several pieces that are attributed with the salt. And usually the salt is put into a complete suite that is a set of aswat, many salts, uh, with, uh, for example, uh, an introduction kind of piece called istima. If we have time, we might put some salt later on. So let's hear some examples about Najd and the upper Gulf area of Saudi Arabia. You can expand on the name, please, a bit. Yeah. So uh, let's start from the beginning. I'll elaborate then. This is a Khammari piece. Just pay attention to the kind of rhythm, complicated rhythm you hear. And it's more than one line actually of ongoing rhythm. Okay. Now this is a Kuwaiti uh, ensemble or group playing an Ajdi Khammari. So you see that these musics are not staying actually in their areas. People are taking music from each other, learning, getting influence, or sometimes just performing the same pieces. And Tariq Abdul Hakim once uh, said, and this is also stated uh, in Lisa's book, that we are not taking music from others. We take and give, and we give and take. And this is normal. Uh, Going to the Khammari, uh, we take an example from the Mam. 
Yes. Which is a big city in uh, Eastern Province. Notice here when they started both of them there is a certain signature for the start of the piece where they go slowly they show the rhythm and then it goes into a peak that is different in variations of rhythms and uh, the speed and so on uh, let's go now for the third example which is coming from a Dar uh, from Darin which is Fujiri the other kind of sea entertainment kind of music next one this way you already did Ah, this one. This is from the mom. So this is the C music compared to Alain the music that we did previously. hear the clapping then by time it will change it will come more of more if actually this is Fujiri uh, Haddadi so let's take the next one this is a video hopefully it will uh, show So this is a, a video on a video <laughs> from a TV. So these are seamen doing the Fujiri uh, suite inside one of these uh, gathering places they call them Dur or Dar. And this is in Darin which is an island in, uh, in Saudi Arabia in the Gulf. So actually this guy is saying that I have promised to get you a recording from this place which means there are recordings that are being hid for some reason. And this guy tried his best to get some recording in the public of such uh, music uh, performances. Uh, this is the same, so we skip it. Uh, let me show you a flavor of a modernized khamari, which is done in the Institute of Music by Ali Hussain in Kuwait, which is an Ajdi kind of khamari. Uh, next one. Not this. Yeah, next one. Okay, the last one is uh, by Dr. Ahmed Salhi, who is a doctor uh, in music. Uh, this guy has done a lot to the music of the region, actually, uh, and also for the music of uh, Egypt and, and all the uh, area. And here he is performing on Oud with the, uh, with the group, uh, one of the Bin Laboon uh, genres uh, of music, which is uh, Khamari. 
So let's listen to some of it. So uh, this is an example. This is a very recent performance, actually, by the group. So you could see sometimes the quality of the recording. Uh, you see a difference between if a professional is doing it versus if it is done by a crowd. You could see that these musics are not all. These are jewels to me and jewels to all of us. They are a very good source of ideas, a very good source of looking forward for uh, composing music that goes into the roots of this land. However, uh, these kinds of musics, to be uh, clear, are very different. They are done by different people, different levels of skills. Uh, and at the same time, you see some of them are not done with music at all. They are done by the voice or just uh, using the drums uh, and the rhythms, sometimes with an introduction of uh, clapping, or sometimes it's a question-answer thing, or maybe two groups. So it's not only uh, a music performance, sometimes it's a movement kind of performance where you will see groups arranged in a way, uh, just like when you go and listen to a concerto, for example, in the great European music, where you see one or two instruments are asking questions and the answers are coming from the orchestra, right? We have similar thing into these genres, not only in our place, it's these are like human ideas that are evolving based on the conditions, the traditions, the syllables of the language, and many other factors to produce such kind of uh, variant kind of uh, genres. Uh, go next, please. Uh, for the South region, we already covered uh, that warfare thing and uh, RASFA, so I'll skip this slide. Uh, next. Let me talk about the story of Bila Bartok and uh, Zoltan Kodai. These are uh, people, two great musicians from Hungary. These guys have done a lot to music, actually, and they are part of the family of the great music of uh, Europe. When they came to their role or their phase of producing their own music, they were stuck. And Bela Bartok and Zoltan Kudai decided to see what else can they do. Because all the harmonies, all the chords, all the uh, forms, uh, arrangement, instrumentation, ideas. For example, Mahler in the great music, he went to a small uh, uh, ideas rather than building on bigger ideas. Some of them, they went into huge suites some of them, they were very mathematical, like Bach, for example, uh, in his pieces. Uh, so when they came, their time was a very tough time, actually, to try to see what else can they do. So Bela Bartok and Sultan Kudai went to the folk and the, uh, the areas of the folk music that's away from the city, from the people they still have uh, uh, the, the tones that are not excluded from the music that decided to go in harmony and counterpoint. There are rhythms that are never used in the great music uh, of Europe, in the compositions. So they went there, tried to notate the music, archive them, study them, and try to produce accordingly. Bela Bartek actually visited uh, Turkey or maybe the Ottoman Empire. And he met uh, the great musicians in there. Uh, he heard 
probably Jamil Tamburi, one of the greatest uh, musicians at that time who recorded and passed away in 1916. He was playing several instruments. He was a great composer. And uh, he played for the greatest composers uh, in the Ottoman Empire age. At his time, he was like the top. Till today, he is the example of the good music player composer. All the young people in Turkey and maybe many places in the Maqam family countries are learning from Jamil Tamburi. Bela Bartok has met him. And one of his compositions was the Romanian dances. One of them is reflecting one of the pieces of Jamil Tamburi, which is the long and crease. You could check that out. Actually, Bela Bartok also was one of the uh, invitees to the uh, conference of the Arabic music, the first one, which is the 1932. And he participated in there uh, in, in the exercises and the lectures and the analysis, archiving and so on, where that conference was made to see what is the outlook of the Arab music at that time? How is it different from the, uh, the other musics? Is it modern enough? Does it need to be modernized? Uh, and that was one of the best uh, conferences that took place actually discussing these matters with big experts like Bela Bartok. So Bela Bartok teaches us a lesson to look into these things that are very neglected, going back to these things because these are the jewels of our identity of music that's covering the whole peninsula, the whole uh, country. Uh, and then we see from there what influences took place actually that made the modern good and bad music available today, commercial and non-commercial. Uh, we are good with what's, what we have today, but we can produce more going back to this chapter. So uh, it's a very good thing to do because the wave of modernization, the wave of the uh, shock we got everywhere in the world with the pop culture, with the uh, modern instruments like the keyboards, uh, the guitars, the orchestration, the harmony, the movies that came and people started to make movies in their own places, mimicking the way people look and feel, mimicking the, the, the stories, mimicking the music in these movies. Now all of that has gone. People has just woke up again everywhere to see where they are now, because these things will vanish after time, but you will come back to a start point where you could go ahead and uh, produce more of things that the world is looking for from you. I think it's a time of a return of great music, which is being seen in many places in the world. And I have discussed this in Jarash in Jordan in 2016, uh, showing evidences of a return of a great music back from everywhere in the world. And uh, many people see the power of uh, folk music, actually, which is not attributed to a certain composer. These are like rocks that has been hit by the wind and the uh, natural forces that has shaped them. They are here to stay. It's uh, one big side of our music and every country's music. And actually, this is owned by everybody in the world to hear and enjoy and get inspired with. And uh, there is one important thing that I really believe in, I, I always promote. The words and lyrics in the music are not important. Music is important. These are just vehicles that we use to produce music, getting inspired by them, by their syllables, by the arrangement, and so on. And that's why you see, for example, the performances of opera being that magnificent even though sometimes you don't know the language being sung. Or maybe it's a historical language, or maybe it's another language. Uh, to have this done, we need to empower musicians. We need to do a great work to have a well-raised musician there to understand and appreciate such jewels, and then be living the day and planning for making the tomorrow. And uh, we know that uh, studying the history, we have noticed that, uh, for example, those great musicians might not be those that went to the academia for uh, studying music. 
And not everyone who did not go to the, uh, the academy is a good musician. So it's a mixed breed of many things, actually, that could coin a very good musician. Uh, after the industrial age, the public education, the one way of education has shown that we have spent many decades actually trying to produce very good creators, very good creative people in many fields. But day after day, we are discovering today that there might be other means of raising people. This is the point I'd like to make in here, too. And a very uh, important cornerstone of any culture is to have a foundation generation. A founding generation, this is a lecture I have actually expanded uh, on uh, recently, stating that the, it is very important to have a founding generation in any field. Is it in, in art? Is it in music? Because this is the dictionary, this is the source of going back to the origins and trying to expand on it. Next one, please. So uh, we have seen the diversified heritage we have. I think we are not uh, unlucky. We were lucky with having such recordings. We'll be lucky to have more recordings. We'll be lucky to have a systemized research and archiving exercise to classify, analyze, and uh, make use of such jewels, actually, and discover more. Uh, with this, we need uh, to work on enabling the generations. And uh, with this, we have to work on what we have today, go forward from what we have today, basing on the founding corners that I just mentioned, and looking forward for making great music that looks like our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fadl. Uh, it's really a great uh, presentation, and uh, the information that you have presented is really uh, very valuable and rich. Uh, just one question uh, is like, what is really the best way, especially in Saudi, to archive and save such treasure mm -hmm. in a very, as you mentioned, in a very systematic uh, way? Because those uh, kind of treasure and jewels that you mentioned goes back so many years mm -hmm. uh, in history. So if we are thinking about another 50, 100 years, to yes. come, that will be so much valuable to inspire, as you said, mm. the next generation of music. So yes. what is the best way in your, in your view? Yes, thank you for the good question. Actually, uh, these records have uh, a lifetime. If you play them several times, they will be worse and worse. Uh, we need a center that is specialized in uh, having these records being music or non-music with a specialized, highly trained people to uh, get these recordings, archive them, classify them, and then digitize them, uh, and carefully uh, take care of them. In addition, those goes uh, side uh, on side with the documentation, which is mostly uh, preferred to be uh, uh, videotapes and recordings rather than going into paper and books, which is a very good component, but it comes in importance after this. And then we need to have researchers that go together with this uh, to go in detail, live with the people, document, record, analyze, and then have a very uh, uh, wide uh, spectrum of other musics to see where the value is uh, laying down. Thank you so much, Father. Yeah, sure. That was really informative. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So that's it for today. We'll see you all tomorrow for a new series of talks and discussions.